So I will be discussing today from a bit different angle uh, regarding personalized therapy for acute leukemia. And I do have to admit that I will be mainly concentrating on acute myeloid leukemia, AML, which is the most common um, leukemia currently in adults. I will be briefly touching the base regarding the pathogenesis of the disease, how we currently diagnose the disease, and what are the major roadblocks uh, for better treatment responses. Um, I will sum, uh, sum up the presentation with our previous and current ongoing work utilizing ex vivo drug sensitivity testing in a clinical trial. Uh, here are my disclosures. As mentioned, we currently we start to understand quite well what kind of disease AML is. We do know that there is 27 recurrent uh, genetic mutations, and on the top of that, there are several cytogenetical lesions that can be observed with normal karyotyping. Um, and currently, we actually do know also that AML is rather a simplistic disease compared to, for example, solid tumors. Uh, the number of somatic mutations is actually surprisingly low. On average, AML genome carries three to five somatic mutations. But of course, considering the fact that there are several recurrent mutations and patients might have mutations, not only uh, in, in their uh, somatic genes, but also karyotypic changes, it's obvious that the disease itself is act it's actually quite heterogeneous. Uh, I find it quite interesting that during the last seven or eight years, we have been also able to unravel how leukemia evolves. We do know that actually from approximately 10 to 15 percent of elderly persons, they do carry the, uh, these pre-leukemic uh, mutations in their hematopoietic stem cells. Typically, they are mutations uh, affecting uh, epigenetics. Uh, namely the NMT3A dead 2 What we actually currently don't know why some of these mutations will uh, evolve uh, to leukemia, but we do know that what are kind of the building blocks needed for the uh, 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 AML to uh, give rise. And we also have quite good understanding what are the late mutations of the disease, with late mutations meaning the mutations that actually are not necessary for the leukemia itself, but modify the disease phenotype. And actually, in quite many cases, also worse the prognosis of the patient. And currently, we start to also understand how these mutations co-occur and play together for uh, getting the leukemia um, uh, getting the leukemia uh, disease. We do know that these mutations, they don't go occur by chance. The first mutation dictates the possible next mutations. But on the other hand, with this, we have possibility to find kind of uh, mutational triplets or uh, mutational duplets that we actually start to understand that what is the difference between these different triplets in the prognosis of the patient. Uh, I think in Europe, and both in Europe and the US, the diagnostics currently has remained extremely similar. Uh, the basic uh, examination morphology, just plain morphology, is still done for all participants or, or patients. Flow cytometry is done to evaluate if the disease is lymphatic or myeloid, and to evaluate also the differentiation status of the leukemic cells. I think it might be surprising for this audience, but we still do plain old um, karyotyping by GM sustaining. The rationale for that is that still both US and, and European guidelines for risk stratification, they still ask uh, karyotyping to be done by GM sustaining in order to kind of have uh, similar stratified risk classification procedures. Uh, in the diagnostic phase, we also do uh, NGS uh, uh, studies. First of all, we try to find out if there are fusion genes. Uh, currently, we do a fusion screen uh, for approximately 
200 recurrent fusions and perhaps the, mo the most important uh, tool is this myeloid gene panel which in who's in Helsinki is in-house ion torrent based panel with 44 uh, myeloid uh, mutations included we actually previously did this in a, in a trial setting in a uh, clinical trial using ex, uh, sorry exome sequencing but currently we are actually quite happy with the myeloid gene panel it creates uh, results robustly it's quite fast it takes three to four uh, three to seven days that we actually do have the results ready uh, from the sampling uh, bone marrow sampling and that's sufficient time for both therapy planning and later on uh, use this information to possibly find the MRD marker which we need to evaluate the treatment responses while the patient receives therapy. I think uh, this perhaps is something that we are going forward to. Uh, this is from Sanger webpage. It's a calculator or dashboard where you can fill in the information from the patient. You can fill in the information, uh, clinical information like age, performance status, uh, several important lab values, including uh, leukocyte count, LAD, LDH, but also cytogenetic changes and mutations. And with this dashboard, you can then model the disease outcome in different settings. This is based on chemotherapy. And basically with this platform, you can evaluate uh, the effect of allogenic transplantation in first remission and then so of course this is just one treatment modality but i think that this is something that we really need to go into deeper that we are capable of modeling uh, responses therapy responses for one particular patient when we plan the therapy ahead targeted therapies has been uh, something that we have been waiting in AML for quite a long time. I have to admit that we have been mainly stuck with uh, conventional chemo, uh, for example, induction therapy that we still currently use uh, was established or already in the 70s. Uh, we were, as mentioned, using conventional chemo, but just the, during the last few years, we have had finally possibility to gain access also to the targeted therapies. Most of these targeted therapies are uh, mutational target, uh, targeted therapies, for example, for FLI3 mutation, namely midostaurin, kiltertinib, but also IDH1 and IDH2 mutation. The problem with targeted therapy still is that although that we have a disease driver and we target that, for example, kiltertinib in FLI3 uh, mutated AML, approximately 30% of the patients uh, will have remission. And same goes for IDAG inhibitors, approximately 40% of the patients will undergo remission. So this primary resistance still remains a major problem, although that we have good targeted agents. I think one of, perhaps one of the most interesting compounds is venetoclax, which is initially developed for CLL, uh, it's a PCL2 inhibitor, so it uh, modifies the cell's ability to, go, to undergo to apoptosis, and I will be discussing venetoclax a bit later. Uh, something that Tommy was also referring to, what we have been doing in uh, FIM Helsinki now for 10 or so years, we have been, uh, we have had run, up and running ESM integrated system medicine project that uh, initially was built up by uh, Olli Kallion, Niemi Kimmo Porka, Caroline Heckman, Kriste Venneberg, um, Thea Pemovska and me. And then basically with this platform, uh, we identified leukemia patients that we took bone marrow samples from, and if possible, we had the bone marrow samples from different time points during the disease course. Then these leukemic cells were seeded uh, on uh, 384 well plates, pre-trucked with 500 
and compounds in five different combinations uh, in concentration, sorry. And after the incubation, we actually were able to see the, what kind of compounds did the patient blood cells respond to, and also by comparing the responses to healthy bone marrow responses, we were able to dissect out that what were the leukemia selective compounds. These same patients underwent exome sequencing, transcriptome sequencing, and actually with this information, we already have quite good information on the patient's disease. Importantly, also, uh, vast majority of these patients gave their consent to hematological biobank, so the samples are also in the biobank currently. Uh, we have currently screened approximately 200 AML patients using this platform, and we currently are in the revision process of, of our latest manuscript on the topic. But basically, this has enabled us, first of all, to understand the disease relapse mechanisms, resistance mechanisms, and perhaps also importantly, find novel biomarkers, uh, possible biomarkers, and also, in some cases, identify compounds that are already in clinical use and identify new indication for that specific compound. I will next briefly uh, discuss uh, about our current ongoing prospective multicenter clinical trial, which is phase two trial. It's sponsored by Helsinki. Uh, and Uusimaa Hospital District and its Finnish Leukemia Group trial. With this trial, we explore if ex vivo drug sensitivity testing for venetoclax is feasible for patient selection. Uh, to enable this trial, we actually first had to develop novel methods for evaluating ex vivo venetoclax sensitivity. Uh, so basically, what we did. Uh, we develop a flow-based assay where we can evaluate sensitivity for each cell population specifically. So we can evaluate blast cells in granulocytes, in lymphocytes. And what really is an additional value is that the resolution is good and the method is robust. So we can actually go quite low in blast count up to or as low as 5%. Uh, this is the study flow. Uh, so we have basically two patient groups entering the study. Those patients with de novo AML, meaning that they haven't received AML therapy prior, or in ARM2, secondary AML or relapsed resistant AML, meaning that they have either relapsed or uh, antidescent hematological disease, mostly MDS. And this validation cohort, all the participants will be receiving the combinational therapy, regardless of ex vivo drug sensitivity testing results. And in the study cohort, only the participants that are sensitive uh, will enter the study. I will be discussing this bit briefly in upcoming slides. Uh, this trial receives no funding from APVI, who manufactures uh, Venetoclax, so this is solely acad academical study, and as mentioned, all university hospitals have joined the trial, and all university hospitals are also recruiting patients. As of today, uh, we have recruited uh, 67 participants for the trial. Uh, our goal is to have a recruitment finalized by the end of the year, when we expect to have the full 100 participants for the trial. Um, just very briefly, want to introduce you to the major results this far. Uh, so in the validation cohort, we finally had 41 participants. Importantly, 40 out of, out of those 41, we were capable of producing ex vivo drug sensitivity results. So basically, we just had one patient that we weren't, due to the very low leukemic blast count, able to find a DSS value. Uh, so that leaves us with 37 participants that are evaluable for ex vivo in vivo correlation, meaning that uh, correlate the response what we see in the lab with the response that we observed in the patient. 
Uh, we also, while doing this uh, trial, we are uh, developing methods using uh, ex vivo drug sensitivity testing and trying to optimize these methods. And, and just to cut down a very short story, we ended up using flow cytometry based assay combined with CM media because it gave best uh, sensitivity and specificity. And now we are looking at, again, these two patient groups. R1 was the patients with newly diagnosed AML, no previous therapy, whereas ARM2 was uh, included with patients with relapsed or resistant disease or secondary AML. And the higher the DSS value is, the more sensitive sample uh, was, for, was for venetoclax. And on the uh, x-axis, you see the in vivo response of the patient. And looking at, looking at ARM2, uh, so basically, currently, we do know that 30 to 40 percent of the patients, they gain response uh, for a, a venetoclax-based combination. And then looking at this data, when we look at the patients that actually achieved an ex vivo drug sensitivity, sensitivity almost 80 percent of these participants actually also gained in vivo responses. So we have currently uh, being uh, recruiting patients for our second stage of the trial study cohort. And basically for this cohort, all ARM1 patients are receiving uh, combinational therapy. And we continue that trial as an observational part. And then for ARM2, we used this method for patient selection. I think it's actually quite interesting that we also see that the uh, biology really seems to be there. Uh, when we're looking at the participants who are ex vivo resistant, their prognosis is uh, presented on the blue curve below. And those patients that were ex vivo sensitive are presented on the red curve above. So there actually is quite a major difference. Of course, we have to remind ourselves that the data is still immature and we need longer follow-up time. But, but it makes sense that, that actually when you see the correlation in vivo, ex vivo, you should also see the correlation between uh, overall survival and drug sensitivity. And finally, I uh, want to underline that uh, we also have this trial being currently started also in other Nordic countries, uh, in Sweden, Norway, um, and in, in uh, Denmark. There are also centers doing ex vivo drug sensitivity testing. So the idea here is of course, to expand this trial as a multi-center trial in a sense that other centers also are performing ex vivo drug sensitivity testing for venetoclax and see that if we actually can replicate these promising uh, results that we have currently uh, seen in, in our Finnish leukemia group Venex trial. And with that, uh, I want to thank you all for uh, your time and I'm happy to take any questions if there is any time.